Are you an aspiring creative in entertainment, business, fashion, design, or the arts? Do you want to elevate your creative passion project to the next level? Then this show is for you. Whether you want a career in television, film, radio, literature, music, or beyond, Creative Breakthrough will show you how to take your dreams and turn them into reality. This show will not only leave you feeling motivated and inspired, but also provide you real-life tools to pursue the creative journey you have always wanted. I'm your host, creative coach, and chicken wing lover, Shireen Kassab, a.k.a. The Funny Brown Girl. Yes, I have an unhealthy obsession with chicken wings. Now, get ready to flex your creative muscle. Lately, I've been feeling the stress. Trying to balance my comedy schedule with this podcast and my full-time job keeps me busy, and sometimes I feel like I just can't keep up. Luckily, someone introduced me to CBD to help manage my anxiety and stress, and it's making all the difference. I now use a CBD tincture and CBD gummies every day. Not only am I sleeping better, I'm also more calm. If you struggle with anxiety, stress, or even insomnia, visit HoorayForCBD.com and learn how CBD can help you. Again, that's HoorayForCBD.com. Tell them Shireen sent you. Welcome back to the last episode of season one of Creative Breakthrough. I cannot believe that we have been doing this every week for the past 34 weeks. I want to say thank you for joining me week after week. I have loved hearing the feedback, seeing the reviews, and most of all, knowing that y'all are listening and getting something positive out of this podcast. It means the world to me. I'm so humbled and grateful that you guys continue to tune in week after week. Season two will start in September, but over the summer, please continue to send in any feedback that you have because I want to make sure season two is bigger and better. A lot of you have asked me, what have I learned from season one? I will say this, podcasting is a lot of work. I had no idea how much time this would take. And I think the hardest part for me is that it does not provide the instant gratification that comedy does, which has been a real struggle at times. I also want to say thank you all for sending in your goals for the summer that I'd asked for in episode 33. I enjoyed reading them all. And I think I I was impressed because there were so many goals that came in and a lot of them just fell around the same themes. A lot of you want to write or submit a TV pilot. A lot of you want to finish a book or start a book. And a lot of you want to increase your performances. So whether it's getting casted or booked on shows. And so I urge you to join the Facebook community. I urge you to join there because I think we can all work together, provide inspiration, and even new new ways of pursuing and attaining your goals. So the website, again, is facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash creative breakthrough community. Or I think you can just search creative breakthrough community and you should find it. I'll also put it in the show notes on funnybrowngirl.com forward slash episode 34. Today's episode is supposed to be a solo episode, but I felt this interview with comedian Tisa Hami a much better way to end season one. In this episode, we talk the full gamut of a creative journey. We talk about finding your passion, pursuing your passion full time, the pros and cons of pursuing your passion, leaving your passion, and the challenges of being a woman of color, and a lot more all in 60 minutes. So I urge you to listen to the end because this story has a wonderful ending. Tisa Hami, activist, idealist, smartass. In the fall of 2002, just a year after 9-11, Tisa Hami dared to do something that no one in America had ever done. Step on stage, veal, and tell jokes. At a time when Muslim Americans were advised to keep a low profile, she chose to stand up. Tisa's groundbreaking humor quickly caught the attention of audiences, bookers, and the media. She earned a reputation for making people think as well as laugh. Tisa grew up in a traditional Iranian family in a predominantly white suburb of Boston. The daughter of a pediatric dentist and a software engineer, she earned her bachelor's and master's degree from Ivy League universities. Her parents were, quote, thrilled that she wanted to pursue a career in comedy. Tisa has been featured in media around the world, including the PBS documentary Stand Up, ABC's The View, NPR, BBC, and The Washington Post. The San Francisco Chronicle named her one of the top 11 female comedians in the country. So, what are we waiting for? Let's get started. Welcome to the guest chair, Tisa. Thank you. Hi, Shireen. 
Hey, I'm so glad to finally get to talk to you. It's been so many years since we've connected. I know. Likewise, looking forward to it. So let's start from the beginning. I'd love to know when your creative journey started. Sure. Um, I was really just sort of one of those kids who did what she was supposed to do. Um, Went to high school, tried to study all the right things, study hard, went to the Ivy League. I know you and I both went to Brown um, and never really thought I would be a creative person. But while I was in college and then after college, I went and worked on Wall Street. Um, People would always tell me, you know, you're so funny. You're so funny. What are you doing here? You should be a stand up comic. Um, And I thought, no, I shouldn't. Like, we're at Brown or we're on Wall Street. We're Ivy League grads. We don't do that stuff. Um, And I thought I would have like a really straightforward, traditional career. Um, So I I never really planned to have a creative life. So this was a surprise even to me. I mean, part of that was cultural and parental expectations, but I expected to have a very standard career. When you said people would tell you you should be a stand-up, had you ever watched stand-up and thought that's what you wanted to do? I had seen it on TV. I had never been to a comedy club. Until I decided to do comedy myself, I had never been to a comedy club. So I had seen it on TV. And I remember one moment stuck out for me. And I think I was in middle school or high school. I was channel uh, surfing one day and I got to star search. And this Asian American woman was on. She was young. She seemed like she was only a few years older than me. And she was on stage telling jokes and she was joking about her family and um, speaking in her parents' Korean accents. And I thought, who is this? And it turns out it was Margaret Cho. (laughs) And I just had, it had never occurred to me that, you know, someone who looks like that or has that story could do stand up. So that moment just sort of sticks out for me. Um, But I still never really imagined I would ever do that. So then what, how did you go about learning stand-up or actually starting to do stand-up? Sure. So I was motivated uh, after 9-11. So after my three years on Wall Street, I decided it's, you know, it's been an interesting run, but this isn't what I want to do for the future. And I went back to grad school and I studied what I had studied in college, which was uh, international relations. And that's what I was interested in. And I got my master's in international affairs and, uh, my second, the second year of my program, I studied abroad in Paris. And I thought when the year was up, I thought I would come back to the United States, I would find a job pretty quickly. And that was that. But I moved back and a week later, 9-11 happened. So among many other things that happened in the country at that time, and the whole mood of the country, there were no jobs. I mean, people were laying off, people thought it was the end of the world. Um, And here I was, with my fancy expensive degrees and no job Mm -hmm. and unemployment that year just dragged on and on. And I ended up being unemployed for over a year, which I had never expected. The thing though, uh, was there were a few male Muslim comics who started to emerge during that time. And I remember a friend of mine, my best friend from high school sent me an article from Newsweek that featured a few male Muslim stand-up comics in LA who were using comedy and humor to really, address the stereotypes and people's fears and combat Islamophobia and all of that. And the the note my friend wrote on the article was, you know, there's no woman doing this or she'd be in this article. And that was sort of her hint to me to really go for it. And I eventually got to the point where I really felt like I had nothing to lose. This job search for a, a sort of a traditional career was going nowhere. And I thought, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do stand up. And really, when I saw it from the point of view of activism, of social justice, of making my voice heard, of speaking up, speaking out, uh, getting a point of view across, that's when I became interested. I was never really like a Hollywood person or trying to be an actress. I really came about it from the point of view of an activist. Uh, So I got on stage about a year after 9 11 in fall 2002. That was my first show. And it took off from there. And I miss what you said. Oh, I said, I'm sorry. Was this in New York? This was in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, in Harvard okay. Square, across oh, cool. from the university at a little club called the Comedy Studio. Yes. Okay. With Rick Jenkins. With Rick Jenkins. Yeah. In the <laughs> attic of a Chinese restaurant. Yes. Um, but Oh, so you mentioned how did I get into it when I wasn't really 
didn't really have that background. I took an adult, I, I took a class at the Boston Center for Adult Education. Oh my God, I took the comedy. same class. Did you? Oh my gosh, that's so funny. <laughs> Who was your teacher? Dana J. Bean. Okay, I don't think I know he, Dana. He may have started after because oh, okay. he is turning, well, I won't tell you his age, but he's six years, so he may have not been there. <laughs> okay. Because okay, I was a yeah. freshman when all this was happening in college. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So I took that class in fall 2002. And so, you know, the class quote unquote graduation is to perform at the comedy studio. Uh, and so that night I was on that first, I was on that show with all first time comedians. I was terrified, <laughs> um, but it went extremely well. Like on my first show, I had multiple applause breaks um, and it went great. The crowd totally got it. And I was booked on the spot for another show, and things took off from there. Wow, that's awesome. Rick does not book people right away. like So that's that's a big... Yeah, that's what I heard. And I didn't really know because I didn't know about this world. So I, I just remember I knew when my comedy teacher's jaw dropped, and he said, when did he book? And he said, oh, he booked you for another show. I was like, yeah, he goes, for when? And I said, Saturday. And he goes, Saturday? And he tripped over the word. And I was like, oh, I guess Saturday's a, a good night. Which yes. now, of course, I know. Yeah, Saturday's a good night. <laughs> so my second show was on a Saturday night show. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it just took off from there. Rick, Rick wow. got it, which, I mean, that was, that was lucky. And, I mean, I still really feel like I really owe it to the audience that night who totally was, who, who got the jokes and supported it and laughed and applauded. And it, it was fantastic. So after that, you just knew that this is what you wanted to do. I knew I wanted to try. Mm -hmm. um, I still had that voice in my head of like, you know, the immigrant child and good Iranian. And now I have two Ivy League degrees to live up to. And my mother's a dentist and my father has a PhD. And I was still in my 20s. It really felt like, hey, I, you know, as my mother always says, it's it's not too late for dental school. Um, so I still had that voice running through my head, but I knew I wanted to try this. I sort of thought this is something I never thought I would do, but I felt like I could make an impact in this way that I could change, hopefully change people's minds or get them thinking or address issues they had never heard of doing that through humor. So this time when you were starting to think that this is what you wanted to do, what were you thinking in terms of making an income? So at the same time as I started that stand-up comedy class in fall 2002, I got a day job at the Harvard Kennedy School. Okay. And it was a 50% pay cut from Wall Street. Um, but I knew that that job would give me my evenings to go out to comedy clubs. And I have to say, the Harvard Kennedy School was extremely supportive of my comedy career. They were That's fantastic. Awesome. That's awesome um, when from, your employers. Yeah, supported. yeah. From my colleagues to my managers to the overall the school, like I performed at school multiple times. They put me in their alumni magazine, which was unheard of if you weren't an alumni of the school. They were super supportive, and I, I'm just still really grateful for that. Now let's talk about your parents. Did they come to your first show at the comedy studio? No, I did not let them come. They came, uh, may, maybe a month or so, and they came to the show. And what did they think? They thought it wasn't too late for medical school. <laughs> um, <laughs> what was that conversation like that they, what, like, did, I mean, how was the conversation in general when they found out that you were doing comedy? I mean, they, my mother, my father sort of expresses his opinion, then sort of lets it go. My mother does not let anything go. <laughs> um, so I, I would hear from her all the time. Like, cause I, I, so I lived with them at the time. Um, because I had that year of unemployment, I had just moved home um, and I was still home and I, I would come home tired from shows and she'd be like, well, why don't you quit? It was always, well, why don't you quit? Um, so that, that was tough because yeah, I would come home tired. And as you know, sh not every show goes well, especially at the start of your career when you're out on like a Tuesday night open mic mm -hmm. and you come home yeah. and you're getting up for your day job the next day and trying to juggle all of that. So it was really, it was tough. When did that conversation with your parents start to change where they became more accepting? <laughs> I think when I started appearing in newspapers <laughs> and on T 
TV and on the radio. And my mother's friends, and particularly her Iranian friends, would say, oh, I, I saw your daughter in the newspaper. And she'd be like, oh, really? Um, and so it took sort of the approval of others, particularly mm -hmm. from the Iranian American community, for her to sort of come around. And then they were proud of you. I, I don't know if I'd go that far. <laughs> Um, they had faith in you. They realized you were funny. <laughs> well, yeah, it was kind of like, well, okay. And I remember at one point, my father, we were watching the Oscars together um, a couple years in, and I, f I forget who was hosting, but it was a comedian. It, it was a comedian, um, and and they were showing clips of past Oscars, and it was like Whoopi Goldberg and Billy Crystal, and you know, other stand ups or people who had started in stand-up. And he said that. He was like, oh, stand-up comics can do this and they can go host the Oscars? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, oh, okay. And th that kind of thing made them come around. I think they just didn't see a career path or a future in it. Um, so I remember that moment of watching the Oscars with my dad and having him see, oh, okay, the career a career is possible here. So when did you realize that? Like when did what what show were you on or did you get off of or what event happened that you finally said to yourself, I can do this for a living? Hmm. I think I always had my doubts just because I knew comedians who as you probably know, you can make it and not really make it and you can be doing well and get TV opportunities and still have your day job. So I, I would say I never really knew, but I think when I got to the point where I was getting enough requests and for each gig, I was getting paid enough that I could go full time into comedy. I was like, Hey, I can actually do this. And it's going to be tough probably because it's not super predictable, but I can, I can at least try. So I was a full time comedian and speaker for five years. And at that time, were you still in Boston or had you moved to San Francisco? When I decided to go full time, I moved to San Francisco. Okay. And why was that? I just wanted to do something different. I felt like Boston, I, I, I grew up in this area. I felt like I just wanted to do something different. Um, and as long as I knew as long as I was in a city that had a comedy scene and had a major airport so I could travel from there, that would be fine. And that actually narrowed it down to just four or five places. And looking at those, I hadn't heard one good thing about the LA comedy scene. And I had heard the New York comedy scene was really tough. So I decided on San Francisco also because at the time I thought I would focus a fair amount on uh, some writing projects that had come up. And I knew in San Francisco, and this is how you'll know how long ago it was, I wouldn't need a day job. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And now you would definitely need a day job, two yeah. day jobs in San Francisco. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's interesting. So the five years you were performing full time, um, you were living in San Francisco. I was. Okay. So you had mentioned this before, like you're, you were making TV appearances, you were in the news. I mean, you were on The View, BBC, Wall Street Journal, you were named top female comedian in the country. Talk to us about how you rose so fast in your new career. Like how did you become so well known in a household name almost immediately? I think it, a lot of it was timing and thank you. I don't, I don't know that I ever made it to a household name, but thank you. I, I <laughs> Well, I remember it. seeing you on the view. I remember I was in college. I don't remember what year I was in. And that's how I, I remember seeing you on the view and being like, Oh my God. Like I, at that point I didn't even know what comedy was and I never wanted to be a comedian, but I do remember seeing you as a Muslim woman making jokes and being like, wow, she's doing something really cool. Really? Yeah, that's how I came to know who you were. And like, when I finally decided to actually do comedy, like years later, that's why I was like, Oh, my God, Tisa, I remember her from when I saw her on the news. <laughs> Can I tell you, you have never told me that. I'm sure I must have mentioned it before. That's how I like got in touch wow. with you because I'm a stalker in that sense. Like, <laughs> Wow. Well, thank you. I'm really flattered. It kind of reminds me of my Margaret Cho story in a way. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was you and Bethany Van Delft. Do you know Bethany? Yeah, I know. But I ran into Bethany two days ago in Harvard Square. <laughs> okay, so she's yeah. the one who finally like got me to actually do comedy. But oh, wow. you're the one who I still remember to this day, like seeing on The View and being like, because I always wanted to be on The View. I don't know why. I just thought it would yeah. be fun to be on The View, but I never thought about 
being on the view as a comedian i just thought you just are a host i didn't know what that meant i I, like you said you go to brown and you just think the next step is investment banking or consulting you never really think about other things to do with your life on the view exactly (laughs) that is so funny well i'm really glad to hear that story thank you um, and now I don't remember your question, but I know I know it was really good. <laughs> the question was, is how did you rise? How did you get discovered and rise so quickly? Oh, okay. Yeah, I think it, it was timing. Um, just being when I started, it was a year out from 9-11. It was scary, frankly, to perform comedy at that time as a Muslim and to get on stage. They, we, they were still telling Muslims to, you know, shh, keep a low profile. Don't, you know, don't show your Musliminess too much. <laughs> and meanwhile, I was on stage. In a full hijab, it, right? In hijab. <laughs> exactly. Um, and so I think it just attracted attention that way. One night at, at the show at the comedy studio, I think I was about six months in, there happened to be a Boston Globe reporter in the audience. And then he wrote about me. So that just six months in, I had a feature story in the Boston Globe. And then others started to pick it up. And I did my own press relations, which I learned thanks to the Harvard Kennedy School. I took some media workshops there. And I, I built it from there. And I saw that people really wanted to hear from a Muslim and a Muslim woman to the point that I was almost at for certain things that came my way. I was like, I don't know if I'm qualified for this. They were, there were times when I was getting interviewed and I was like, they're looking for a religious scholar or they're looking for an academic, but they're asking me, I guess, cause I'm here. Um, so I saw that people were curious, they were interested. And so I think the timing was right. And I think there were those who just thought, well, the, you know, oh, she she's getting stuff because the timing was right. No, you still had to be good. I mean, I yes. remember, um, I, I won't mention his name, but there was a male Muslim comic who started um, maybe like a year after I started in the Boston area. And he really didn't get anywhere. And, and his career stopped just a few months in. So it wasn't just that you were Muslim and suddenly you were in the paper. I mean, you still had to be good. Um and so I, I think it, I think it was that. I think it was just a combination of things, but the timing was right. Did you ever feel like even that Muslim man? Did, did you ever feel like you got extra scrutiny just because you not only were you Muslim but you were female? Oh sure. I mean, even from other comedians. What um, was harder, being Muslim or female? <laughs> which one was harder? Oh gosh, I don't know. Um, probably Muslim, frankly, because there there are other well. So again, like, I don't, I don't, well, if you know Bethany, you might know, we used to do Boston's annual women of color and comedy show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Color struck. Color struck. Exactly. So we used to do that show. And before I joined it, I, I happened to join it in its fourth year, but I heard that in earlier years, some of the comedians in Boston, particularly the white male comics would boycott the show and they had their own anti women of color comedy party. Oh, interesting. I did not hear this story. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So I heard that and it was like, oh, okay. I mean, we're not talking about the Stone Ages here. We're talking like, you know, maybe like the year 2000. I mean, it might feel like a long time ago now, but it's not Stone Ages. Mm -hmm. And they were having an anti-party. So yeah, it was not a great time to be doing this as a woman of color, period. And then yeah, as a Muslim woman. Were there any shows that you stick out where you were scared, whether getting on stage or off stage, or someone said something? I, I was scared a lot. I was scared a lot of the time. Uh, I was scared, particularly, frankly, when I would appear in the paper, uh, because they would list my performances, or people would look me up and go to my website. I would see the hits on my website would increase, and people were seeing my schedule, and they were seeing exactly where I would be and when. Um, So things like that scared me. Thankfully, you know, there were no incidents like that. I did have scary moments after shows um, with people. Um, One show in Indiana sticks out in memory. But I I was scared a lot, but I still got on stage. Can you tell us what happened in Indiana? Sure. I was doing a show at a college, uh, Valparaiso University. Uh, and in, in this small town in Indiana, they had happened to do international 
recruiting to, I guess, increase their diversity. And so they had happened to have a fairly sizable contingent of male Saudi Arabian college students. And they all came to the show and the show overall went great. It was great. But after the show, they came up to me. And one was sort of like the spokesperson for the group. And he pointed to his friend who was scrolling through his camera. It was a digital camera at the time. And he was like, my friend, he he wants to talk to you. He wants to show you something. And I was like, okay. And he got to what the picture he wanted to show me, which was, so the school had put up posters of me around campus to promote the show. And someone, I don't know if this guy had done it himself, but they had crumpled up a poster of me and thrown it into a urinal and he had taken a picture. And he showed me that. And I said, okay. I I had had enough reactions to my shows by then that I was like, okay, I knew there was no point in engaging. Mm -hmm. And I think they were actually upset that I wasn't upset. And so they were trying to get me he was like, he wants to talk to you in his room, in his dorm room. What? Yeah. And I was like, I'm not going to his dorm room. I can talk to him here. And they were like, no, he wants you to go to his dorm room. And I was like, no. And by the way, there were other people around. The professor who had invited me was still there. The student group that supported the show was there. So there were others there. Um, but it just got intense and heated and weird and at one point, the the professor and the students just moved me into a conference room. They just got me out of there. And they were like, just wait here. We're going to pull up a car and take you back to the hotel. Oh, wow. Yeah. Do you think if they do you think they wanted you to the get you to the room to like hurt you or I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't think it would have been good, but there was no way I was going. Yeah. Um, but they ca- I was in that conference room for 45 minutes. And by then, a student had come and pulled his car up to the curb to get me. When, when I left that room 45 minutes later, this group of guys was out there waiting. Wow. And I got in the car and we left. I think that was probably the weirdest incident. Yeah, that's definitely definitely something that, you would, that, would, that would scare me too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I'm sure over the, over time, like when you were doing some of these shows in more rural places, like not these bigger cities like San Francisco and Boston, there was a lot of ignorance. How did you deal with that ignorance? Yeah, you know, it was weird. When I first started traveling and my, my manager at the time, she specialized in diversity speakers and performers. And where there is a, a want and a need for diversity speakers and performers is where there isn't much diversity. So <laughs> yep. I spent a lot of time going to the central time zone, to rural America, to places that were hours and hours from the nearest airport. And the nearest airport was small. Um, and I remember the first time I was going, I think my, one of my early shows traveling was in rural Wisconsin. And I heard from the event organizer you know, we, we've never seen a Muslim before. And I was like, oh my God, what am I going to say to these people? Are they even going to get the jokes? Because you need to have sort of some knowledge and background in, in the stuff to kind of get the joke. Mm-hmm. And then it got to the point where I started hearing a lot, it a lot, like we've never seen a Muslim before. I heard this from Kansas, Missouri, Tennessee, Kentucky. It almost got to the point where if I didn't hear it, I, I, I was like, oh, I guess they've seen a Muslim, you know. <laughs> um, so yeah, I was worried about people getting the joke. I, as I said, I was scared every time. But people got the joke. I think part of it is m- most of the places I traveled to, it was to a college campus which can just be a different pocket, even within a, and the surrounding community can be a little bit different, but it can sometimes be a a liberal pocket or just uh, a more woke pocket (laughs) within a more conservative community. Mm -hmm. So I was actually very pleasantly surprised that everywhere I went, people got the jokes. Hmm. So you really didn't have trolls and people coming at you with any sort of spewing hate and stuff that that sort of built up? 
I think the closest was that. I think the worst was Indiana. Mm -hmm. I remember I performed once in Colorado Springs at, I think it's Colorado College there. And one thing I actually liked was almost always when I was on a college campus, the show was still open to the wider community. And I would say about half the audience tended to be from the outside community, which to me was great because I was reaching an audience that I might not reach otherwise. Um, In this particular town, they had told me there were four military bases in town. And this was during the Iraq war and people were out from the military bases. And during the Q&A, as as you probably know, a a lot of Q&As, you're not really asked a question. Someone gives a speech. Yep. (laughs) So I remember particularly Colorado College, just people got up in the Q&A and gave, you know, sort of heated speeches about the Middle East and war and Iraq. And I I remember I was sort of, you know, I mean, as a comedian, you you can always handle it. But I remember others in the audience actually started to just kind of take them on a little bit and be like, hey, we're not here for this tonight. So it actually worked out okay. Just kind of the audience talking among themselves, and I would kind of have the microphone and, and, you know, kind of take control of the situation again. Um, But yeah, there, there were like moments like that. But overall, it was really, really great. So interesting to hear you say that. Do you find, do you think, and this has nothing to do with comedy, but do you think that the perception of Islam has gotten worse over the years to where we are today, or has it gotten better? Hmm, it's hard to say. I mean, maybe just different. I think back then to even be a Muslim and be in the public eye at all was so unusual. And even though it's still unusual, we see it a little more. Like I remember after 9-11, part of what made me want to do something public was when I turned on my TV to CNN and all the news stations, every Middle East expert was an older white man with the occasional white woman thrown in. And I thought, where are we? Why aren't we speaking for ourselves? Yeah. Now, (laughs) when there are events in the Middle East, there are actually Middle Eastern commentators. (laughs) So I, I, I'm glad to see that in terms of perception, you know, with different presidencies and different events, you know, th- things change, they come and go. But, you know, it used to always be, you know, when people would speak generally about something like, oh, go to your church, or they would say, go to your church or temple. And now sometimes I hear mosque thrown in. <laughs> So I'm like, oh, hey, people are kind of aware of us. You know, Coke yes. has had a couple of commercials, a couple of commercials with a hijabi woman. So, I mean, there's a little more presence. So I'm glad to see that. But, you know, have we ended Islamophobia? Of, of course not. Yeah, maybe it's because I perform in Florida, but I've had some, I've had some, I've had multiple incidences where people, I've had to be escorted to my car. Oh my gosh. <laughs> like there was times when I didn't get on stage for a couple of weeks after incidents because, well, oh, no. I just was so scared. And I, I mean, I got banned from a club because I was Muslim. <laughs> oh no, I'm sorry to hear that. And you're reminding me, so did I. I got banned from the Comedy Connection in Boston, which was at the time the biggest comedy club in Boston. Yeah, and it's so liberal. So what happened there? Uh, Well, Boston, there was a difference here definitely between the Boston comedy scene and the Cambridge comedy scene. Uh, The Cambridge comedy scene was more like liberal, the ethnic comedians perform there, women perform there, and Boston was still pretty much white guys talking about their dicks. Got it. Um, So (laughs) I wasn't a white guy talking about my dick. And yeah, I went to the Comedy Connection. I was a new comedian and new comedians only got on the Monday night open mic. And I remember the booker there, Joey, I just went to thank him at the end of the show. Like, you know, you shake hands and you thank the booker and he would not touch me. And he would be like, that's not, and he didn't even look at me. He looked past me to other comedians and said, that's not okay. What she did was not okay. And he said some other stuff. And I remember actually one of my comedian friends, Denise, she walked to me to my car that night. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's surprising that that would happen in Boston. But I guess, yeah, you're right. Cambridge is definitely more liberal than Boston. Yeah. And it was still 2003. I mean, it, it has been 15 years since then. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I think, yeah, things have changed. Yeah. I mean, I think I find that things have changed 
um, a little bit more after the election. I, I mean, when I look back on it, I don't remember ever being so scared, but lately just the, the number of people, I mean, some guy recently just threatened to kill me after show because I think his PTSD set in from being at war and I, I had to explain to him like he couldn't take that out on me, but he was in such a rage. I mean, you could, his eyes were bulging out of his face. Oh no. Gosh. Sorry to hear that. That is, wow. That is crazy. But yeah, I guess that's also Florida. So (laughs) Mm. we we hear a lot of stories from Florida. The rest of us don't always understand Florida. I don't get it either. I'm going to have to really write a book and do some psychology yeah, really classes. And- Please explain Florida to us. <laughs> when I figure it out, I will. Excellent. <laughs> so you, you mentioned you were doing speaking engagements too, and I'm assuming these were around being Muslim. Did you have to go and like learn about Islam to become scholarly, or was it just more mm-hmm. like educating people about your lifestyle and your day-to-day? Mm-hmm. So these were, when I did a speaking engagement, it was always, there was always a performance first, and then I shifted to a speaking engagement. Um, So they had seen me perform, and it was mainly for college campuses. And so it was more about like the, the journey I had taken to comedy, the lessons learned from the road, giving them tips as they thought ahead to their own careers. So the talk was still more in terms of personal storytelling and stories from the road, as opposed to some scholarly lecture on Islam. What were some of the challenges you faced? Like what were some of the stories from the road that you told them? Um, Well, some of the ones I I shared with you. (laughs) Um, And I would also, I mean, I would try to share good ones. Like uh, one show that I was scared about in advance was one I did in rural Kansas Ooh. And it was a really small town, Concordia, Kansas. And there's a community college out there. I think it's called St. Cloud Community College. And it's, it's the nearest airport was Wichita. And that was a three hour drive away. Wow. So you were just driving past fields for three hours to get to this campus. And the town was, I think, something like 5,000 people. Uh, and I was told that it was like something like 99% white. We, you know, again, I heard we've never seen a Muslim before. Um, and another thing I learned about the town, cause I looked it up was that in world war two, I hope I'm remembering this right. During world war two, there had been a German prisoner of war camp in this town. And once World War II ended, some of those German soldiers stayed and settled in the town, which means it was settled in part by Nazis. So I, every piece of information I was learning about this town just made me more and more scared for this show. And then on top of that, I, it was my actually it was actually I had just moved to San Francisco. Within my first week, I was traveling for this show, and the PBS camera crew was coming with me for the documentary. And I just thought, I need to be good, and I'm super scared. But in this small town, they actually have a beautiful old theater uh, because they used to be on like the, the, rail, the railroad, and so they had a beautiful theater in this town. And the theater was pretty full that night, and the show went great, and I got a standing ovation from rural Kansas. That's awesome. That is yeah. So I try to share good stories too, and I, I, again, I'm I'm missing details now that I remembered more back then. But it it, it was really a like a fun show, and and for me, like a, a highlight. And I've done hundreds and hundreds of shows, but I still remember that one, and I remember the theater and the town, and 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 even the conversations after the shows, which started to become my favorite part of the show was the conversations I would have with people from the audience after the show. Yeah, sometimes those are the best because you you can tell one on one you're helping change perspectives. Yeah, exactly. And they're like, "You're my first Muslim friend. Can we take a picture so I can tag <laughs> it on Facebook and say met a Muslim?" <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I know you you mentioned Indiana. What happened in Indiana? But how did other Muslims react when they would come watch you? Mm-hmm. I would say there was a range. <laughs> um, they tended to be the biggest supporters and the biggest opponents. And I think when I started, again, thinking back to 2002, I sort of thought the, the, the people who would really oppose me were your run-of-the-mill bigots and people who hated all Muslims and thought we were all terrorists and whatever. And it actually turned out to be other Muslims who were the biggest opponents. And is that because so they thought for- you were too liberal? 
Yeah. And that I shouldn't be doing this. The hate mail I got from Muslim men was epic. Um, and I got, I got fan mail too, but yeah, I mean the, the best and worst reactions were from other Muslims. Well, nothing's changed there. So you'll be proud to say I'm carrying that torch. I I believe it. Excellent. (laughs) Good work. Yep. You taught me well, Tisa. Excellent. So now, um, I mean, when people find out you're a comedian and whenever people find out you're someone's a comedian, they think it's such a glamorous life and you're on stage and you're making (laughs) people laugh and like, that's all there is to it. What are some of the other challenges you faced as a comedian? Oh, so many. Uh, The money. Oh, he doesn't Um, pay you well? No, I'm just joking. (laughs) No, really. So, I mean, I I think for considering that, you know, I would travel and be on stage for an hour. um, I probably made more in an hour than I'll ever make again, unless I really hit it big with some other thing. Um, So so the pay when I got paid was fantastic. Um, But it, it could be once a week. It could be once a month. It could be less. So uh, the unpredictability of it, the lack of stability of it, that was all tough. Um, The travel was really hard. And people think it's this fun, glamorous career. And it is good to be on stage and and connect with the audience. But it's also a very solitary life. Um, You're performing, you know, you're writing material by yourself, traveling to shows by yourself, you're on stage by yourself. So that, that was a challenge of it too. I sort of missed collaboration. I missed having colleagues. Um, so there, there's a lot that's tough about it, but I think, I think for me, the lack of predictability and the travel were probably the hardest. So then after, um, so now we're at kind of, we've gone through your journey of being a comedian and what happened, what was that deciding factor? Cause then you stopped doing comedy. Yeah. What, what was that deciding factor? Was there an incident that happened or was it just exhaustion what happened there yeah i it it wasn't really one incident i i stopped performing in early 2015 and i think for a number of years i had had after i was full time for 5 years i sort of after that for a few years was one foot in one foot out uh and there was a point you reach or i reached where i realized i wasn't going to get my own tv show i wasn't going to be ellen i wasn't going to be seinfeld and that was okay. Um, you know, you can still have a pretty good career and not get to that point. But I thought, I realized I could keep doing this. I could keep traveling to the central time zone and doing shows at all these schools. But for one thing, I felt like I had aged out of the lifestyle a little bit of being out at clubs <laughs> a lot of that level of travel um, so I, I just felt, and I, and I was starting to be a fair amount older than the students in the audience. And that just felt like not quite, I, I don't know. It just felt different than when I had started out. And I just wanted more stability in my life and more predictability in terms of a paycheck and health insurance and less travel. So I think all of that just kind of contributed. Uh, so how long have you, you've been out three years now, right? I've been out three years. Do you ever miss it? I miss having the platform. I miss expressing my ideas, my point of view. Um, I think especially with the current administration, there's just a lot to say, um, especially from the viewpoint of a minority, a Muslim, a woman, an immigrant, etc. I think there's so much to say that I, I miss having the voice and the platform. I do not miss the lifestyle. So do you ever just get on stage locally? No, I decided to make a clean break. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So do you have any other outlets that you now utilize to get out, get across your point of view? None. I have no opinions anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't taken to Twitter? <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, I love Twitter, but I'm not super into it. Um, and, and uh, you know, everyone's just always getting into Twitter fights. And I'm like, you know, what I don't need in my life is Twitter fights. <laughs> so no, do you? Are you are you big on like Twitter and political opinions and all that? I will go on Twitter and read political opinions. I myself do not make political opinions because I yeah. do have my full time job. And I'm still not sure right. what is appropriate and what is not appropriate. <laughs> 
<laughs> right. Okay. So yeah, that's a great point too. Yeah. When you have an employer, I mean, one of the things I loved about comedy, especially being full time in it was I really only had to answer my, to myself. Mm-hmm. And yeah, there wasn't this employer I had to worry about and whatever. It was just like me out there. And I was the sole. And really, at a certain point, you're running your own business. And it's a small one person business, but I was running my own business. And one thing I loved about that was being the sole decision maker. And I say that having worked at big organizations in my past where there were layers and layers for any decision and any person could knock it down. And I was like, being a sole decision maker really makes things much more efficient. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I'm sure it was so much more relaxing when you were um, a one person show and you could say what you wanted and not have repercussions if someone ever saw it on the internet. Right. And when I started, oh gosh, can you believe it? There wasn't YouTube (laughs) and there wasn't, Facebook. <laughs> well, you you know the, we just didn't have the same outlets that we have now. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean, no one had to worry about that stuff because we just didn't have it. Now there's so much access, and yeah, you you want to be vocal and outspoken and all those things that comedians are. But yeah, you got to watch it for your day job and all of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you you have no idea who's following you either. It's like. When I make a comment about work sometimes and someone will comment back, I'm like, oh, my God, I didn't even know you followed me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Super awkward. I'm like, I wasn't talking about you. Not you. I met that other coworker <laughs> when I wrote your name as my coworker on Twitter. Yes. Oh. So like looking back now at your life as a comedian and where you went and what you did, I mean, again, still, I still think you were a household name, even if you don't think that. Um Thank How you. do you feel like your creative journey shaped you? Hmm. There are times that I am really glad I did it. And given my current, you know, employment situation, there are times I really regret ever having done it. Um, so I toggle between the two. I think mostly I'm really grateful for the experience. It's something I never thought I would do. Uh, and so to have that opportunity to speak to people, to speak to audiences directly and, and to give them a, a stories that they likely hadn't heard before. I mean, what a fantastic opportunity that was. At the same time, it did in terms of not having sort of made it in terms of income and, you know, not having a career like Ellen or whoever, and having to go back to the world of day jobs, it really set me back. And when you... S- so... Oh, no, go yeah. ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just saying, it really set me back once I tried to go back into day jobs. So I have my moments where I go, where would I have been if I had never done this comedy thing? When you say set you back in terms of day job, is it? do you mean you're not as far in your career as you had hoped? Or is it hard to go back into the workforce because people think you're not serious about working? Both. Um, One thing I've noticed is, uh, so I'm actually looking for a job right now. And people don't really understand comedy or the as much as I try to sell this transferable skill set. And look, I've done all this stuff. And I got on stage and I I did build this career. And Shireen says I became (laughs) a household name. And, and I think people just still think that it's like, comedians are just people who are talking about their body parts at the chuckle Mm -hmm. hut they don't think about you running your own business and doing the the finance and the outreach and the media and the marketing and everything else that we do to make the whole thing run they just think of you know you know your little jokes at the chuckle hut so i i think I, i i wish people understood careers in the arts and just how much it takes a little bit more to know that even if it's your desk job that you're looking for someone for an artist with that background still brings a lot Mm -hmm. to the table. That's true. Yeah. I mean, some people, like you said, yeah, people still think it's, you're still up there talking about your genitalia and not being an activist. Exactly. So, exactly. So before we go into the lightning round, last question for you, what advice would you have for creatives on their journey? Mm -hmm. I would say it's going to be tough. There are going to be ups and downs. If you love it, 
do it. There are going to be moments when you hate it. That doesn't mean you give up. And try. And you may have a great career. If not, you had a life experience that maybe you knew you wouldn't have. But know that there will be ups and downs. It's not going to be a linear line that just goes up. Yeah, I think we forget that as creative sometimes. Yeah. there's There will be setbacks, but you just got to push through. Yeah, and the, the timelines can be a lot longer mm-hmm. than you think. Uh, like I remember early on hearing, oh, it takes 10 years to become a really good comedian. And I was like, 10 years? Ugh, you know, um, but it can take a long time to get really good at your craft. Well, it seems like you found your voice pretty quickly. I, I think I had that. And I, I mean, I, I was 29 when I started comedy, so I wasn't like super young. So that me, so when I said I came about it from an activist, I was always that person. So it was just about translating that onto. Oh, okay, stage. so even before you started comedy, you were always very outspoken about your religion and culture. Um, I don't know about religion. I would say I grew up in like a more moderate Muslim family, but yeah, about being an immigrant and being Iranian and that whole life experience, I. Yeah, I'm I'm a quiet person, so it's not like I was, you know, (laughs) shouting in the streets and whatever. But I I had definitely given it a lot of thought. As an introvert, I had thought about it a lot. Um, So I think once I got to the stage, I knew myself and Mm -hmm. I knew my stories. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. So we're just going to jump into the lightning round. Lightning round, I'm going to ask you five questions rapid fire and just answer whatever comes to your mind first. What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? I don't know. I, I think about, I, I, I would say since I'm sort of in job search mode, that when you think about what you want to do and where you want to work, think about not just what the job is, but who is going to be there and who that's going to attract. That, that might have saved me some time on Wall Street. If I thought about who would be there. And when you say who would be there, do you mean the people you mean the, the people, people you're spending time with? Yep. Oh, yeah. All day, every day, you're spending time with them. Yeah, Wall Street's interesting. Yeah, that's one word for it. <laughs> Where'd you work on Wall Street? Oh, are you ready? Yes. Uh, so I worked at a law firm called Sullivan and Cromwell, which I don't know if you know, but people in the law firm world will know that name. Um, and then in banking, I worked at J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs. Oh, okay. I worked at J.P. Morgan too. Ah, okay. Interesting. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't last very long. I kind of was like, yeah, I want to go home now. I'm tired and I never want to come back. <laughs> oh, that's kind of how I felt too. And also, I don't know your experience, but looking up the ladder, I was like, no one here looks like me looking up the ladder. And I was oh, like, yeah. I, I mean, will that's... not succeed here. I just will not. <laughs> that's like every career I've been in. But Every career I've been in too, story. but I would say especially Wall Street. I was like, you know, I... I hesitate a little bit to say this, but the only people who looked even remotely like me were on the food services staff or the custodial staff. It was it's not so the partners <laughs> at the law firm or the managing directors at the bank. Yeah, it's funny you say that because one of the jobs I had in my career, someone thought I was janitorial and oh, asked yeah. me for toilet paper. And I was like, no, I actually work in this building and yeah. I'm just using the bathroom. <laughs> yep. Yep. We all have those those stories. Yeah. Okay. So what is a written or verbal resource you would recommend creatives on their journey to read or listen to? I would say Anne Lamott's book, Bird by Bird. Okay. What's that about? It's about, it's basically about creative writing or about writing. And I I think that was a pretty good one. When I thought I would write a book because I got approached about writing a book. I read a few different books on the, you know, writing and the creative process and her, hers was probably one of the better ones. So off topic, why did you decide not to write the book? You know, I, because of comedy, I got approached about a bunch of different things. One of those was writing a book and I got approached a few different times and it just seemed like such a, it, it seemed like a tough opportunity to turn down Because I actually have writer friends who have books and are trying to get published and are trying to get an agent. And here I was and it fell into my lap. But if I had to be honest, I really didn't want to write a book. It it just, 
I, it's not really something I wanted. Um, and so I, I never finished and I'm okay with that. Who inspires you and why? For me, I think it's the, the, the activists, the people who really changed things. Uh, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, uh, even sort of the celebrity ones like Oprah, Princess Diana, um, the people who really used their voice in a way to make positive change. What's a habit that's helped you on your journey? I thought these were going to be easy, Shireen. <laughs> a habit that's helped me on my journey. Um, I, I think I just have that immigrant discipline still. I'm still that like Ivy League grad, go get it done. So I would say uh, discipline and always having the drive. What do you want your legacy to be? That hopefully I made people think as well as laugh. Yes, I think you accomplished that. <laughs> Thank you. Tisa, if people wanted to find you online or email you, how could they do that? So I... I don't have a website anymore. I used to have tisahami.com, which then got bought by a Russian bot, I think. Yes, it's like and some now, healthcare. Yeah, or like they skincare. sell skincare. <laughs> so if you would like to go to tisahami.com and buy skincare products, it helps me not at all, but go ahead. Um, but if you want to find me, I am on the Facebook at facebook.com slash tisahami. I am on Twitter, which I, I don't tweet, but you can follow me there. Um, that's about it. I'm not on Instagram, Snapchat, all that stuff. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Tisa. This was awesome. Thanks, Shireen. You were great. This was fun. Thank you. I try to be great. I work on that daily. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Tisa Hami is now a diversity and inclusion consultant and trainer. She works with corporate clients on creative ideas to advance diversity and inclusion in their organizations, including training programs that feature interactive theater, stand-up comedy, and storytelling. She regularly speaks and performs at diversity and inclusion conferences nationwide. This is such an amazing story of how Tisa was able to pivot her creative passion and combine her passion for comedy and activism. And with that, I say goodbye until September. Now, go flex your creative muscle and keep winning. Hey, before you hit pause, did you find this episode helpful and enjoyable? If so, could you leave an Apple podcast, aka iTunes review? It'll take you less than one minute and mean the world to me. The more ratings and reviews the show gets, the more people are able to find this podcast. If you're unsure how to leave a review, no worries. If you're on your iPhone or iPad, go to the homepage of this show and scroll down to write a review. Click on it and you'll be able to rate and review the show. If you're on a Mac from iTunes, go to the show homepage and on the top, click ratings and reviews. Also, please subscribe to get the latest episodes once they drop. If you enjoy the episode and know someone who would love it, please share. From your iPhone, click on the icon with three dots and then share via social media, email, or text. If you want to hear more, head over to funnybrowngirl.com forward slash podcast. You can also find me online. I'm on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Funny Brown Girl. Also, sign up for my free newsletter for more tips to advance your creative journey at funnybrowngirl.com forward slash subscribe. And again, if you enjoyed the show, do me a favor and subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. Now, go flex your creative muscle and keep winning. Thank you for listening. See you next week. <laughs>